Hello, everyone. This is the Catholic Esquire coming back to you for part two of the Synod of Destruction. This is a continuation of the discussion on the final document of the Synod of Synodality. In part one, I talked about where they're claiming this authority from and how Francis is claiming this is all part of the ordinary magisterium now. And, and the reason why he chose not to issue his own document and just sign his name to this one. I wanted to continue with a discussion of the document itself to show you today really how this isn't so much about changing anything on women as ordination or or even changing the mass. Not yet. That's not the purpose of this process. The purpose of this process, as I explained, was to change the structure, the entire way the church operates throughout the entire world from the lowest level of the parish priest, the lowest level of the parishes. All the way up to the top. And this this is the plan they have in store. And they intend to implement it. And some bishops are already saying they're going to start implementing this right away. So let's take a look at the document. Let's go back to it. And I can show you what I'm talking about. Okay, we are looking now again at the Synod Synodality's final document. You'll recall in part one, we already talked about paragraph 22, which was where it talks about the sense of the faith, giving them their authority, the authority to actually make decisions on matters of faith and morals and church government. So we're going to go ahead and start now at paragraph 26 today. And this is one of the more controversial paragraphs because this is the one talking about liturgy. And it says in there, in the full, conscious, and active participation of all the faithful, in the presence of different ministries, and in the presidency of the bishop or priest, the Christian community is made visible, whereby a differentiated co-responsibility of all for mission is fulfilled. For this reason, the Church, the body of Christ, learns from the Eucharist how to join together unity and plurality, the unity of the church and the multiplicity of Eucharistic assemblies, unity of sacramental mystery, and variety of liturgical traditions, unity of celebration, and plurality of vocations, charisms, and ministries. A few things in this paragraph to keep your eye on. You're going to see references throughout this document to presidency or presiding in connection with a bishop or a priest. And you see that here with this reference to presidency of the bishop or priest. Now, Traditionally, you would always say a priest or a bishop celebrates the Mass, but we all know since the Second Vatican Council, it is more common to hear talk of how they preside over the Mass. Because remember, presidents or those who preside over an assembly, they're there not so much to, to, to do the work, but more to coordinate the work of other people. This is assembly theology. This is one of the Errors that got filtered into the Second Vatican Council and found its realization in the new Mass. I'm not here to talk about that today. What I'm here to talk about and tell you is, is this concept is now going to be filtered in throughout every other aspect of the Church, not just in the liturgy. But here they're talking about it in the context of liturgy. Uh, also, this term co-responsibility. You're going to see co-responsibility a lot in this document. Co-responsibility refers to laity working with bishops in, in performing functions and tasks and church governance and making decisions. And so you're going to see that a lot. So whenever you see co-responsibility, no, they're talking about laity and clergy working together. They both have responsibility, whereas most of the situations they're talking about used to be uh, functions and tasks reserved to the clergy, you see. One other point here on this issue with the liturgy, though, is they, they make a distinction here in paragraph 27 about Eucharistic assemblies versus synodal assemblies. And see, what they're trying to do here is say, look, we're all one big Church of Christ, Catholics, Protestants, Eastern Orthodox, whatever. and so. We can have assemblies together and worship together and do the, all these other things. And some may have the Eucharist there, some may not. But you see, they're trying to create this notion that a Eucharistic assembly, like a Mass, is just one way to engage in uh, 
ecumenical solidarity with our brethren who are also part of the people of God. Okay. So, so yeah, what this paragraph is basically doing is opening up the idea to lay in more lay involvement in the mass, different types of masses, depending on the culture, even opening up different types of liturgical assemblies to non-Catholics. That's what this is all about. It just simply opens the door for that. And remember what I said in part one, this document is not about implementing substantive changes to the church's teaching on sacraments. What it's about is changing the process. We're going from a hierarchical, patriarchical, monarchical structure that's the way Christ set it up and we've had for 2,000 years. They're dismantling that and replacing it with the synodal process. So, this document is explaining the synodal process for how future changes in the church are going to be made. Now, let's scroll down. You'll see this reference, deepening the link between liturgy and synodality will help all Christian communities. That's what I just said. In the diversity of their cultures and traditions to adopt celebratory styles that make visible the face of a synodal church. And so they're going to call for a specific study group that will be interested and reflect on how to make liturgical celebrations more an expression of synodality. So basically saying, look, we're going to create another group. And that's what synodality is all about. It's all about creating groups and assemblies and people voting on things. And that's what they're saying they want to do with the Mass. Paragraph 30 talks about different aspects of synodality. It says synodality denotes those structures and ecclesial processes in which the synodal nature of the church is expressed at an institutional level. So basically what they're saying is, yes, we are seeking to change the structures of the church, the processes by which decisions and governance is done. That's what they're doing. That's what they're saying. They're putting it right here in the document. And part of this is that it involves the whole people of God in various ways on local, regional, and universal levels. So from the very top to the very bottom, even below the parish level, is what they're talking about. And they're going to, as they say here in paragraph C30, 30C, uh, they're going to discern the way forward and particular questions and to take particular decisions and directions. So they're going to have authority and govern the church. If we go down to paragraph 36, you're going to see a reference here uh, that the synodal process uh, desires uh, has a desire to expand possibilities for participation and for the exercise of differentiated co-responsibility by all the baptized men and women. So all the baptized men and women, that's Protestants. Okay, because remember in the Second Vatican Council, they said the Church of Christ isn't isn't just the Catholic Church or equal to the Catholic Church. It's broader than that. It's all of the baptized. See, they're going to get all of the baptized men and women involved in this synodal process. In this regard, however, the lack of participation by so many members of the people of God in this journey of ecclesial renewal was a source of sadness. I just highlighted this because I thought that was funny. Um, they were basically complaining that no one cared about the synod of synodality. They were sad no one wanted to participate in this. Well, probably because it's not Catholic. All right, keep moving on. Paragraph 60, uh, there is no reason or impediment that should prevent women from carrying out leadership roles in the church. What comes from the Holy Spirit cannot be stopped. Additionally, the question of women's access to the diaconal ministry remains open. This discernment needs to continue. So this is the other controversial paragraph because it says the diaconate is still open to women, contrary to what Francis always says. Now, I think, why did Francis do that? Well, he is a Peronist, so he's going to tell one group of people what they want to hear, another group of people what they want to hear. But he did sign off on this document, so he is saying that, yeah, oh yeah, he thinks the di the diaconate ministry could still be open to women, even though he previously said no. Uh, I think he pre personally, I think he previously said no, just because he didn't want that to be an issue for this synod. Again, the issue for the synod is not the substance, not changing the sacraments now. 
It's changing the structures of the church and the processes by which future changes will be made. And so I think Francis was getting annoyed with some of his more leftist colleagues because they kept keeping these issues open. It was a distraction. It was a distraction from accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish, which is restructuring the church and dismantling the Catholic church. That's what he wanted to do. I think that's why he previously said, no, we're not going to talk about it. But going forward, absolutely. That's basically all paragraph 60 says. It doesn't say anything else in that in that regard with regard to that issue. Paragraph 70 talks about a bishop's service, um, and it is carried out through the proclamation of the word and presiding over the celebration of the Eucharist and other sacraments. This is why the Synodal Assembly desires that the people of God have a greater voice in choosing bishops. Wow. So they want to have lay people have a say in who which bishops are chosen. That's very, very interesting. Um, it is true. Laity had a say in the selection of bishops in the first millennium of the church's history. But that really uh that really was put to rest throughout the second millennium, probably for good reason. But now these folks here at the Synod want to get more involved in who's cho- who gets to be bishop, just like the Protestants do, because it gives them more power and control. And obviously, when you control a bishop, you're going to ultimately have a pretty strong say in the direction of the church overall. Continuing on, down to paragraph 74, a more active distribution of tasks and responsibilities and a more courageous discernment of what properly belongs to the ordained ministry and what can and must be delegated to others will enable each ministry to be exercised in a more spiritually sound and pastorally dynamic manner. What they're saying here is they want to take away functions and tasks from priests and clergy and give them to lay people, and including decisions uh, and including with respect to the decision making processes. So, having a say in control over the church itself and church governance. That's what that paragraph 74 basically is saying there. 77 says the lay faithful, both men and women, should be given greater responsibilities or opportunities for participation. No surprise there. Participation of laymen and women in church discernment processes in all phases of decision making processes. Greater access of laymen and lay women to positions of responsibility. Uh, lay people serving as judges in canonical processes. Basically, doing everything they can to give power to laity while not entirely destroying the sacrament of holy orders. Now, in paragraph 92, it says, In a synodal church, the hierarchical structure of the church established by Christ, it says it both serves unity and legitimate diversity, uh, but such an exercise of authority is not without limits, it says. It may not ignore a direction which emerges through proper discernment without a consultative process, especially if this is done by participatory bodies. In other words, it's saying this hierarchical structure, we're not getting rid of it, uh, but they're going to be subject to the decisions of these bodies. They can't get away from it. They can't ignore it. They're going to have to be consulting with lay people to tell them how to do their jobs as bishops. And that's why it says later on in 92, they need to revise the Code of Canon Law, because even in the modern Code of Canon Law, such a thing would be a complete novelty. So they want to revise canon law to to accommodate these changes in the structure and of power and authority in the church. I, 116, it defines what a local church is, by the way. And in this document, they understand that to be a diocese. So keep that in mind. Local church equals diocese. Now, in 119, it says placing greater value on the intermediate spaces between the local church, the diocese, and the universal church, such as ecclesiastical provinces and national and continental groupings of churches, can foster a more meaningful presence of the church in the world today. So, what they want to do is create a whole other layer of bureaucracy in the church between the diocesan level and Rome. And actually, it's going to be between the Episcopal conference level, which they absolutely want to keep and empower 
and Rome. So it's going to be another layer of bureaucracy where lay people get to have involvement and a say over what happens in the church. And speaking of the Episcopal conferences, they definitely want to keep that. And 125, that's addressed. Uh, what I found was interesting, 125, D and E, it's going to say, well, E especially, it says, the Episcopal Conference is specifying the decisions made by an Episcopal Conference impose an ecclesial obligation on each bishop who participated in the decision in relation to his own diocese. So, you're basically taking power away from an individual bishop and giving more to the conferences, uh, requiring the bishops to do what these Episcopal Conferences want them to do. This is not, this is not the way Catholicism and the church is structured, my friends. These Episcopal conferences were an invention of the Second Vatican Council, and they just keep putting more authority to them. Now, those ecclesiastical assemblies I just referred to are addressed here, I believe, and again, 126. In the synodal process, seven continental ecclesial assemblies that took place at the beginning of 2023 are both relevant in innovation and legacy that we must treasure. So, they admit it's an innovation. They are an effective way of implementing conciliar teaching on the value of each great socio-cultural region in pursuit of a more profound adaptation in the entire area of Christian life. Again, this is restructuring and creating. They're taking power away from the hierarchy, the priests, the bishops, even the pope, giving it to lay people, and then they're creating more bodies of assemblies that will have authority, governing authority, but also magister magisterial teaching authority to, con to control larger and broader groups of, of, of people. This is just unbelievable. Yeah, they claim, without compromising the authority of the bishop within the church entrusted to him, the collegial exercise of such competence can further the authentic teaching of the one faith in an appropriate and cultured way within different contexts. Right, so even though we just saw that you know the bishops are going to lose authority and control of these bodies, they say, but don't worry, we're, we're not doing it without compromising their doctrinal and disciplinary competence. That's, uh, that's very... That's very interesting if you actually read what's written on the paper. All right, continuing on to 129, uh, to realize a sound decentralization. So they admit that that's what they're doing. They're decentralizing here. And an effective enculturation of faith, it is necessary not only to recognize the role of Episcopal conferences, but also to reevaluate the institution of particular councils, both provincial and plenary. Again, they're, all of these councils and assemblies, they just want to create, uh, to create and give more authority to. Now, the service of Bishop of Rome, this is interesting. Uh, beginning on 131, it talks about this. And it says, well, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, is the foundation of the Church's unity. Um, he's the one that convokes the Church in synodality and presides over it. There's that word presides. And then confirming its results. You see, it's not the Pope making the decisions. It, he's confirming the results of the synods. And so that's his role as a presider, as the president, to coordinate all of these things. But ultimately, the decision-making process is not going to be him. It's going to be these assemblies and councils, etc. Together with the Bishop of Rome, the College of Bishops has an irreplaceable role in shepherding the whole church and in promoting synodality in all of the local churches. But you see, the that's, that's conciliarism. That's an error of the Second Vatican Council. The College of Bishops does not have a role in shepherding the whole church. No, only the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, has authority over the universal church. The individual bishops have authority in their own diocese. That's traditional Catholic teaching. Again, this document here just reiterates many of the errors of the Second Vatican Council. Coming to the end here, in order to further these relations, the Synodal Assembly proposes to establish Council of Patriarchs, Archbishops, Metropolitans of the Eastern Catholic Churches, again, presided over the Pope, which would be an ex that expression of synodality and an instrument for promoting communion. Again, the Pope here is just going to be presiding all of these Eastern, Eastern 
Catholic churches while letting other people actually make decisions. It does talk in 134 about the synodal reflection on sound decentralization with respect to the office of the papacy. Um, I don't think we need to go through that right here, but check out paragraph 134. Um, you know, the, again, what they really do is defer back here to the Bishop of Rome document. I already did a video on the Bishop of Rome document. I explained to you what they're attempting to do is dismantle the papacy itself. They claim for ecumenical reasons, but I also say it's part of deconstructing the Catholic Church, which is the ultimate goal. So basically here they're just saying, we're going to rely on the Bishop of Rome document. Go back to that and read it, but we agree with everything that's in there. Again, if you want to know about the Bishop of Rome document, go check out my video uh, under that title. Formation and synodality in the church's synodal style will make people aware that the gifts received in baptism should be put to good use for all. So what the last part of the document here talks about how all of this synodality stuff needs to be taught to the lay people. It needs to be taught in seminaries. It needs to be taught to the priests. We need to have lay people involved in, in selection of people of candidates for the priesthood. That's paragraph 148. Um, talks about avoiding uh, incorrect information in paragraph 149. I'm sure that's people like myself, Taylor Marshall, other traditionalists online, um, basically says we need to present online information reliable ways. So we don't want our seminarians or lay people listening to people like us. My friends, I went through this very quickly. I did want to try to keep this around 20 minutes, but I just wanted to give you a quick summary of what's in this document and how it's changing the entire structure of the Catholic Church. And so with that, we can conclude. I will just summarize all of this again for you from part one and part two. What happened with the Synod of Synodality was an attempt to restructure the entire Catholic Church, the way it's governed, the way the magisterium operates, and most importantly, who participates in that process. The biggest problems, the biggest issue here is essentially the empowerment of lay people at the expense of the clergy, including the priests, the bishops, and even the Pope himself. Now, I know many of you might be thinking, well, that's not a bad idea given the current situation. Uh, but please remember, it's a very, very bad idea because the church was established by Christ for a reason. There is a reason why we have a hierarchy, a patriarchy. We don't involve women in leadership for a reason within the church. There is a reason we don't involve lay people in the church for a reason. This was established by Christ, and it's what always has been the case for 2,000 years. What's happening here is an attempt to dismantle the church, deconstruct it, and create something entirely new. And as you know, as I pointed out in the first, the first part to this, this view of the document, Francis supposedly says this, is, this document itself now is part of the ordinary magisterium, which binds all of us. But of course, we cannot, we cannot agree with anything that contradicts the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ or, through, or the traditions of the Catholic Church, including the First Vatican Council. And so, my friends, continue to pray that all of the faith will remain strong in this, that there will be an appropriate, appropriate pushback uh, from all Catholics throughout the world against this insanity, and continue to pray for the conversion of those who seek to destroy the faith, destroy the church, and create something entirely new, entirely foreign, that quite frankly resembles a lot like a ministry of Antichrist. Thank you for listening to the video. Subscribe to the channel. God bless.